Good morning. Let's get started. A um, little talk about GStreamer. What's coming up? Um, what have we been up to? Um, just some updates, basically. Nothing too low level, just some high level overview to, um, you know, for those who are not following uh, every day. Quick introduction, who am I? Um, I'm Tim, I hack on GStreamer, I'm one of the maintainers and uh, developers, and I'm also the release manager when we get to releases. Um, next, what is GStreamer? You probably know this, just to run quickly for those who are interested. Um, it's a multimedia framework, which means audio, video, subtitles, etc. Um, we try to be cross-platform, toolkit agnostic, so we're not tied to GNOME. We try to work with you know, Qt, OpenGL, whatever you desire. We try to integrate with everything, basically. Um, we provide libraries for you to build applications uh, on top of. And we have very high-level API and very low-level API. And we don't invent the world ourselves. We, we wrap other libraries um, and make use of them, like FMPEG for software decoders and encoders, for example. Uh, different, we have yeah, specific high-level APIs for specific use cases, like a play bin uh, for, a, for media players. We've got encode bins. We've got an RTSP server API. You can, you can put your camera or whatever you desire on the, you know, serve it as an RTSP stream with six lines of code. Uh, video editing, web RTC, voice over IP, we can do it. And we try to integrate with everything. So if you have a problem integrating with whatever you want to use GStreamer, let us know, please. All right. <clears throat> what have we been up to? Um, first of all, releases. Um, I, well, there was supposed to be a release already um, in December, if not before, and it's not there yet. So the next release coming up is 1.16. We try to do a six-monthly release schedule, so you know as you can see it's kind of working out. Um, but yeah, next release coming up is 1.16. That should be out this month, hopefully. And after that, with a bit of luck, we might get back to our six-monthly release schedule. Um, my excuse is we've been moving to GitLab. So before we've been tracking bugs and patches in Bugzilla, and um, yeah, that was. OK, for a while, but you know, the, the world has moved on, and people want different workflows, and GitLab is, is great. Um, yeah, so we moved to GitLab, freedesktop.org. Uh, you, can, you can file your patches as merge requests there. Um, you can t file issues there, and everything has been migrated, basically. And people just want that sort of GitHub um, merge request style workflow, and it's much nicer. And we can merge stuff with a button, which is also nice for us. Um, also, we get um, CI continuous integration, which basically means we now check you know, if the code compiles and if the tests uh, work before we merge stuff. Um, it's awesome, isn't it? Like, yeah. Couple of things um, that, that landed in 1.14 and afterwards. Uh, WebRTC, that's already there. Um, it's basically when people ask, how do I stream stuff um, to my browser? Yeah, the answer is always it's complicated. You know, which browser, which platform, which operating system. Um, you have like a, a five, uh, five dimensional matrix, and yeah, it's a lot of work. And then you can't really do low latency. WebRTC is a common standard. It's implemented in all the major browsers. It provides for low latency streaming, basically, and it rocks. It, will, it means you can now stream to your browser um, very easily. You don't have to consider 29 different codecs um, on you know, 50 platforms, but it'll just work. It's really cool. Um, people have been building really nice stuff with it. Most people use Google's WebRTC library, which works nicely um, if you want to you know, build that and integrate it. Um, but it's not very nice to use. So we have our own WebRTC stack, basically. Uh, that and, and that means yeah, you can use it. You can stream to browsers. You can build your own applications. And um, yeah, any stream works. You can leverage all of GStreamer, which means you know, you, you can use hardware-accelerated encoding and decoding. Everything that works in GStreamer will work with WebRTC. You don't have to encode or, you know, decode. You can just remux if you want to. So that works nicely. A couple of new features um, there are, are in Git for WebRTC. We've got data, data channel support, um, bundle support, forward error correction. That means, uh, you know, lower latency, basically, and making sure that we can correct errors. Retransmission support, which is another way to, to correct errors and make sure we don't miss packets. But retransmission means um, more latency, whereas forward error correction means higher bandwidth. In general, uh, we have landed a, f a forward error correction well, framework support um, in our RTP stack that can be used not only with WebRTC, 
but we've also used it in RTSP, and you can also use it standalone if you have use cases for that, if you just want to make your own RTP pipelines. Um, the trade-off is basically latency versus bandwidth. Forward error correction means you can check what the connection is like, how, many, you know, how much packet loss is there. Um, if you detect packet loss, then you can sort of increase your bandwidth a little bit and, and um, transmit more redundancy. And that means the receiver can basically restore missing packets um, without having to, to ask and wait if they come back again. You can just restore it. We've implemented an RTSP server for one method, but not for the other. AV1 video codec support. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of AV1. AV1 is a new uh, video codec. They've uh, frozen Bitstream recently, and it's basically a royalty-free next-generation video codec. Um, if you like, it's basically what Opus Audio did for video. I'm really excited about that because it means, you know, once that lands and we get support for that everywhere in hardware devices, etc., you know, your Android phones, basically, um, we, we will have, we will be able to have um, a patent-free codec stack for audio and video that can be used everywhere. Um, we've, we've improved support in GStreamer. We uh, added support for various containers, and we also um, improved the software encoder. The software encoder is still very, very slow, but you know it, it works, and we added more options for you to fiddle with. I'm sure it will improve over time. Embedded systems, loads of improvements there. I'm not going to talk about that because Olivier has a talk about that later. So um, go to that and he'll tell you all about it. SRT means Secure Reliable Transport. It's basically a new protocol. It tries to sort of find a different trade-off between TCP, which gives you, uh, you know, reliability, and UDP, which just means you send packets into the void. Um, it's basically a replacement for RTMP, you know, sort of broadcast streaming use cases. And it, it, it's, yeah, it, find, it found a lot of adoption in the industry. So we support it. We recently refactored the elements to, to you know, make them more natural to use in our SRT environment. And uh, you know, we, we basically changed the way that the sources and the things work. And they can both work bi-directional. Um, Playbin 3 is our sort of Playbin abstraction. Um, we've added recently support for gapless playback and for pre-buffering. So basically, you could, if you play audio or video or something, once the download of the old file finishes, you can immediately start downla uh, downloading the new one. We had that in the old system as well, in the old playbin. Uh, but the problem was, you know, in the old playbin, everything operated in, in raw decoded video and audio domain, which means you needed multiple decoders working at the same time. The new abstraction doesn't do that anymore. Um, so that means if you are on an, on an embedded system, you don't suddenly have multiple decoders running in parallel, completely you know, starving your, your uh, very limited embedded resources. So that works quite nicely. NVIDIA, NVIDIA graphics has um, various APIs for hardware accelerated encoding and decoding, um, NVDEC and NVENC. We had already an NVENC encoder to, you know, to you to to leverage that and encode stuff with hardware. We've added some new formats uh, for the encoder, H.265, which is HEVC. And uh, the decoder is new, so we can now decode as well. And we, we upped the uh, support for new SDK versions. And all that integrates with, with OpenGL and hardware acceleration and stuff, so you can do zero-ish copying, etc. Some stuff that will land in the upcoming release. Um, we have loads of optimizations everywhere, as always. Uh, buffer list support, um, you know, lots, we got rid of lots of little allocations for all kinds of stuff. Non-interleaved audio um, means we have to, you know, less copying to do in order to rearrange channels and stuff. Um, we worked quite a bit of, on reducing latency um, in various elements, which means, you know, you can start up quicker. Uh, video encoder and decoder, we improved uh, the parallelism by uh, dropping locks when they're not required. OpenGL, uh, sorry, uh, UDP source can now capture packets with a buffer pool, which also means le uh, fewer allocation churn, basically. Uh, and yeah, and OpenGL has DMA buff improvements, which is good for zero copy on Linux platforms. One big thing um, that's always been missing for years, and I've been mentioning it, and finally we have it, closed captions. Closed captions are basically these, these text 
subtitles you, you see on, uh, you know, on, on, on uh, TV stuff. And it's mandatory for lots of use cases. You know, broadcasting people need that stuff. So um, we've always didn't really have proper support for it. And now we have proper infrastructure, and we have implemented it um, in many cases. So we can capture it from SDI uh, signals from, from capture cards. We can output it. We, we can uh, read it from move files. MPEG-TS, of course, that's what you get um, you know, as, as digital TV, basically. And also standalone files. We've got SCC and MCC support. So we can build really cool stuff. And of course, we've also got plugins. Um, you, can, you, know, you have an extractor. You have a combiner. Uh, you have converters. And we can also extract them from, from old um, analog signals, basically. So that means that we can, we can put basically, um, we, can, we can put closed captions on the video buffers and pass them around in the pipeline. And you can mix them and extract them and reroute them. And they can also live as a separate stream, basically. So we can yeah, do lots of new cool stuff with that. Um, we have a new WebKit-based source element, which means it you know, basically acts like a browser. So you can stream whatever a browser would output into your, you know, a pipeline and, and uh, yeah, make a video stream of it. That's quite cool. RTSP server, that's our server library that you can use to, you know, to make something available via RTSP. Um, it has seen lots of improvements, performance improvement for TCP interleaved <laughs> streaming. Um, we have forward error correction support now. And in soon, we also have um, support for on with trick modes, which is used for security cameras if you want to you know, uh, review footage. And uh, tri trigger modes is basically fast forward, fast reverse, etc. The Intel Media SDK is basically an API that is provided for hardware-accelerated hardware um, video and audio decoding on Intel graphics hardware. And we've got plugins for that as well now. And they've got improvements for new codecs, uh, DMA buff support, and video post-processing for decoding, which makes the video look nicer, basically. We have various plugin modules. Um, one of them is GSD plugins bad. And people don't like the name bad. And it's not very nice. But yeah, so we have, a, we have an ongoing effort, basically, to move things out of bad into other modules, like GSD plugins good and base and whatnot. Um, that is always takes a little bit of work, but we're working on it. So the, later, the latest stuff we've moved is um, video aggregator, which is a base class for mixers. It takes multiple inputs, and it handles uh, live inputs properly. So if you have multiple video inputs, and you know, one, one of them just drops off because someone um, tripped over the network cable, you want the rest of the pipeline to continue uh, right, and not just the entire pipeline to locked up. You want to make sure that you still produce video just with the, all the other inputs. We can do that now. And Video Aggregator is basically the new base class for that. And we've moved that into GSD plugins base, which means we can also move our compositor plugin um, into base, which is our video mixer, our new video mixer. Um, and there's also OpenGL-based mixers, which do the same thing, just hardware accelerated. And they're also in base now. So that's quite cool, um, because that's quite a quite an important part of many GStreamer pipelines. And hopefully the next bit we move will be GSD Player, which is a new, a new media playback abstraction. Stuff uh, coming up in the future, maybe. Neural networks. Neural networks was like the hottest topic at the GStreamer conference um, last year. I mean, everyone's doing it. Uh, if you're interested in that, there's really cool stuff. Look at the um, talks page where you find all the talks recorded. Um, Scalable streams is also a big topic. Scalable streams basically means you have some kind of base stream, base layer that you can decode individually. And then you, have, you can have extra streams, and they, they, they provide more features. For example, you could have one stream encoded as in full HD resolution. And if you want to go up to 4K, you have a second stream. And instead of having a second stream that is encoded individually as 4K, you just encode the difference. The same thing, for example, for uh, normal video, and then you want to provide high dynamic range, more colors. You can do that as an enhancement stream, for example, or higher frame rate, things like that. Um, yeah, these are big topics, and we, we are working on your know, signaling for that in GStreamer <coughs> architecture and infrastructure. And hopefully, one day, Playwin will just be able to pick it up and it'll just work. Um, 
trick modes. Usually when you change uh, the speed of something, especially in things like uh, adaptive uh, DMUX, like Dash and HLS pipelines, uh, it takes a while uh, until you change speed and you have to basically flush and then seek somewhere and then you know, the new speed happens. It would be much nicer if you could sort of just change without, uh, you know, without breaking the data flow. And we can do that now. Um, we can basically, uh, well, not now, but that's something we work on. Um, and that will hopefully land after 1.16 at some point that you can much quicker um, switch speeds and make them you know, faster and slower. We always do performance optimization. There's lots of stuff coming up. Um, what else? A couple of things. Mason, Mason build system. Um, we've been working on moving to that for, for a while. It's really cool. It's really fast. Um, if you haven't checked it out yet, do that. It's basically like, you know, keep all the uh, nice parts of CMake, but, you know, do something from scratch. Um, and it's, vi it's, going, it's widely adopted. I mean, lots of people are, are moving to it. GNOME is moving to it. Systemd has. Um, I think VLC might be working on it. Um, it pff, yeah, Mesa, uh, Mesa. And we as well. Um, so our goal is basically that 1.16 is hopefully the last release which will have an auto tools built. And with a bit of luck, we will be able to remove it in the next cycle. And then that will be the end of it. Um, yeah. We can build on the Microsoft compiler using that because AutoTools didn't support that, which, will, which is nice. Rust. Rust is something. Uh, it's a new system programming language, if you haven't heard of it. It's basically like the C++ we always wanted but never got. Um, <laughs> so yeah, fast, safe, productive, pick free. It's really cool. Um, we, you know, people are checking it out. Um, we have, uh, it's a really cool community. It's really what we need as well. The ecosystem is really nice. Um, and it's being adopted by lots of people. I mean, you know, Mozilla are using it widely, but also lots of other companies. Um, we don't have, I mean, you know, just to warn you, we don't have a plan to rewrite everything or something, but we, we have really good Rust bindings. So, you know, you should write applications in Rust. Um, that should be nice. Um, yeah, we, we have a plugins module now, and they're official and they're upstream. So we might add more plugins in Rust. Stuff on our radar, SDI over IP, uh, you know, CUDA, better OpenCV integration, um, high dynamic range video. Um, we, we, I mean, we do that already, but we, we're missing some signaling, so we can, we can improve on that. And that's all stuff we're going to look at. That's all I have. Um, thank you very much, and thank you to the organizers. And if you have any questions or comments, um, I think we might have two minutes or something. Uh, we have five minutes, so don't hesitate. Yep. A question, excellent. Coming. Thanks for the talk. Could you uh, help promote getting this version 1.16 into Debian update? Uh, what, do I, well, what do I have to do in order to do that? I think we're missing the Debian freeze, um, but I don't know if anything is required to get it into the updates repository. Sebastian? No? Right. So, I mean, I think we're going to mi mix a cutoff in Debian, and then maybe it goes, goes into backports or something, but that's not something we have control over. I mean, we're going to release it when it's ready, and it's not ready for the freeze. So, I mean, it's not going to happen in three days. It's, sorry. If you know people in Debian, you can bribe, then, you know, maybe we can tweak it. But I don't know what the process is to get it overruled or if that makes sense or not. Um, yeah. But usually people who use Debian stable don't really care if they have one 14 or 16. Any other questions? <laughs> so you mentioned the uh, um, forward reader correction yeah. with uh, an even level of protection. Right? Yes. Yeah, so I was wondering uh, how far you're going to go down this uh, rabbit hole. Was that, that IFC is not exactly trivial. And I've seen Chrome does uh, le only level zero. I was wondering if you want to do something more complicated about this on your side. I don't know. It's not really a question of want. It's a question of, you know, 
if someone really needs it. I mean, the thing is, that the ULP FEC spec, it's not really, it's not very good technically. It's a disaster. It's a, I mean, I don't, it's just, it's horrible technically. But I mean, there's a better spec being worked on. Uh, is it Flex, Flex yeah, Fec or something? Yeah. But I don't think that's stabilized yet. So as soon as that comes out, hopefully. Well, it's, it's used, but I don't know if it's stabilized yet. So I think that's sort of what we should be working towards, too, because that's much, much better in all respects. It will solve lots of problems. Um, yeah, that'd be nicer. Uh, yeah, I think so. In RTSP, we have it only support in record mode, I think, not in play mode. But it shouldn't be too much work to add if you need that. Other questions? No more questions. Excellent. Thank you very much. Enjoy the conference. Thank you.